Metal Gear is one of the most iconic video game franchises that has ever existed. Hideo Kojima and the folks on his team had managed to push the limits of gameplay and narrative for over two decades and deliver a series of games that will forever be etched in the minds of gamers. And surprisingly, not many people have actually had a chance to play all of these games. The downside to having a franchise of games that spans over two decades is they're remarkably hard to play in the modern era. So I decided to take up the challenge of playing all of the core Metal Gear Solid games on my stream to kind of show people what these games are about. And to my surprise, during this entire endeavor, Konami actually announced the re-releases of the Master Collection of 1, 2, and 3, and a whole remake of Metal Gear Solid 3 in the form of Metal Gear Solid Delta. So with the Master Collection and Metal Gear Solid Delta giving people a chance to play these games in the modern era, I'm here to talk about whether or not these games actually hold up to the immense reputation the series has accrued. So how exactly is this video going to be segmented? Well, for my stream I played what I consider the core Metal Gear Solid games, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, Peace Walker, Ground Zeroes, and Phantom Pain. I also played these all in release order, which in my opinion is the best way to play these games. Now even though playing them in chronological order may sound enticing now that technically the entire timeline is all filled in, each game's narrative was really only built with the previous game's narratives in mind, so I really, really do think you should play these games in release order to get the full picture. I also don't want to spoil people on the game's narratives for those of you who are using this video to decide whether or not to take the plunge on these games, so I'll be talking about the games in a real general aspect at the beginning of each of their sections and then doing a deeper dive on the narrative in a section that I'll mark out with a call out with spoilers or something like that. So with that underway and all set out, let's go ahead and get started with the first Metal Gear Solid game. Now given how much I love Metal Gear Solid, it's actually kind of a surprise, but my stream playthrough of Metal Gear Solid 1 was actually the first time I had ever gotten the chance to play this game. I've owned all of the other Metal Gear Solid games, but since this one wasn't included in the HD collection, I had never actually got an opportunity to play this. Now, when this game initially released, it was incredibly revolutionary gameplay-wise, but given I was three at the time, it's a little hard for me to comment on just what the video game space looked like back when this game released. But even playing this game 25 years later, I was honestly pretty impressed by the presentation of this game, especially the opening. The heavy influences of action films is immediately apparent as you get dropped into the game as the stealthy Solid Snake, while some opening credits play across the screen. The opening hours of this game are honestly incredible, doing an exceptional job of showing off the core of how these Metal Gear Solid games will play. The opening iconic rooms of the elevator waiting sequence in the helipad area still go down as some of the greatest areas in the franchise and are either iterated upon or referenced in future games. The helipad sequence in particular is a huge standout, introducing the player to cameras, spotlights, and guards to avoid, as well as guards that will follow your footprints in the snow making the player think about all the tracks that they are leaving, which honestly still impressed me in 2023. You also get immediate gratification from exploring, being able to find equipment right away to add to your arsenal, as well as multiple routes into the next section. The game also makes clear its cinematic presentation almost immediately, with a fairly lengthy cutscene to help introduce the players to a lot of these elements. The gameplay of this game is exceptional, though it is probably where the game shows its age the most. The need to press aim before shooting as well as the inability to shoot while crouched or prone is incredibly jarring on first start, and the overhead view can sometimes make it difficult to see what you're shooting at, though the game does seem to be balanced around this fact. However, the sheer multitude of options you have outside of just a gun more than make up for the slightly awkward gunplay. The CQC is particularly fun, especially when you find yourself flipping dudes off of balconies or choking them out after using noise or footprints to trick them into rounding a corner. While this may seem like basic gameplay to anyone who's played any other Metal Gear Solid games, I was honestly impressed it managed to feel this good on the first 3D iteration. The gameplay also manages to continue to iterate on itself as the game progresses, continuing to give you upgrades or new options to keep the stealth gameplay fresh. The boss fights in particular add a very fresh mix-up to the normal guard dispatching gameplay you may be used to. The boss fights all require a different piece of equipment or skill to keep you on your toes, and there are some really standout ones here, including the sniper duel, which would get a callback in some form in nearly every future Metal Gear Solid game. Might be on the game journalist, Abe, come on! 
While the original's gameplay may seem bare-bones 25 years later, especially if you've played some of the later entries, the advantage is the bones are the skeleton that all of those future games are built upon, and it is still quite fun to play. One of the most impressive things about this game is just how much the player is capable of doing. We've all seen people play with Guard's AI to pull off some fun tricks, but something this game does that I feel needs to be talked about more is how much the game really expects from you. The game really shines when it forces the player to think, not always all on their own, after all you've got your trusty Codec team to help you out, but it still leads to some really incredible gameplay moments that, for the sake of spoilers, I won't go too deep on now, but the game really makes you feel like you're outsmarting or outplaying your opponents. One of the more contentious discussion points around the Metal Gear Solid franchise is the writing. However, in the case of the first one, it's largely regarded as one of the more cohesive entries, with some of the most consistent theming, and this really shines through in the cutscenes and the codec calls. Even with the, as far as I'm concerned, ancient graphics from the original PlayStation, Kojima and team managed to convey the personalities of each one of the characters we see, and managed to create an incredibly engaging cast of characters by playing on, and subverting, some classic action movie tropes. This is a great example of when I think Metal Gear Solid characters are really at their best, when it's a small, cohesive cast of characters, all involved in a relatively small plot around themselves, that the player is unraveling along with the main character. Every character involved is incredibly engaging, and somehow the game manages to fit in goofy, silly moments right alongside hard-hitting gut punches of scenes that will all but rip the tears from your eyes. This kind of mix of tone will become a staple in future Metal Gear Solid games as well, but I feel like it works especially well in the early games in the franchise. The last thing I want to talk about before we get into the narrative and more spoiler-heavy territory is the aesthetic. The game's environment and music is honestly stellar. Making your way through the secret base in Alaska feels incredible, from the multiple outdoor areas covered in snow to the hallways and rooms where it feels like scientists could have actually worked. It feels like a real fleshed out area you are exploring, and all the while the incredible soundtrack adds to the ambiance or tension of a hectic alert phase. Couple that with the incredibly impressive cutscenes and characters I mentioned earlier, and you have an absolutely incredible tactical espionage action experience. Before we get into spoiler territory here, for all the folks that want to avoid them and skip ahead, I just want to leave you with the fact that this game really is worth playing. It's the game that launched the Metal Gear Solid games into the stratosphere in terms of popularity and future expectations, and the only thing that really ages it here are the old shooting mechanics and graphics. But as far as I'm concerned, that's just another point for playing these games in release order. Playing this in chronological order right off of The Phantom Pain is going to feel incredibly jarring, and might lead to a less enjoyable experience. Okay, let's get into the spoilers. The first thing I want to talk about is the narrative. As far as Metal Gear Solid games go, it is easily one of the more straightforward plots in the franchise. You play a Solid Snake, the man who killed Big Boss in the Metal Gear games, on a task to stop Foxhound, who, under the leadership of Liquid Snake, have taken control of a nuclear missile research facility holding the new Metal Gear Rex, which is capable of launching nukes. The terrorists have taken hostages and are requesting the remains of Big Boss as well as one billion dollars in 24 hours. Your first couple tasks as Solid Snake involve finding the hostages and getting a bit of info about how to shut down Rex before those hostages die a mysterious death seemingly out of nowhere. This is where the mystery of this game really starts to churn. Neither the player nor Snake nor anyone on the codex seems to have any information on why this is happening, and it makes for an incredibly engaging side narrative to go along with the normal mission you've been given. As you continue to progress through the facility, you'll meet a couple allies in person, Meryl and Otacon, two characters who I think are incredible, barring the misogynistic aspects of Meryl's characterization. Both Otacon and Meryl both have their own stories and struggles that, while they do include Snake in the larger terrorist plot, are also so unique only to them, with Otacon wrestling with making a weapon of death just like his father, as well as losing someone he truly cared for in Sniper Wolf and Meryl struggling with wanting to be a soldier of her own volition and choosing her own way to live her life. These two characters complement Snake's emotionally stunted character quite well by lending the story a good way to have these emotional themes explored as the plot progresses, while maintaining Snake's characterization as well. The other major characters you'll meet along the way are largely members of the Foxhound terrorist organization who also manage to have their own personalities, ambitions, and goals. Sniper Wolf, Vulcan Raven, Psychomantis, Revolver Ocelot, and Liquid Snake are all incredibly unique, 
both in aesthetic and story, lending their own perspective to why they're fighting for the terrorist organization and what they hope to accomplish, while all having their own theming as well. Their boss fights too are also just as unique as they are, each requiring a completely separate skill to tackle them that also matches their theming. Sniper Wolf Sniper Duel is an obvious standout here and is essentially the prototype to a later fight that is often in contention for one of the greatest boss fights of the entire franchise. The most iconic boss fight in this game, though, almost certainly has to go to Psycho Mantis. This fight features some of the coolest uses of video game hardware by having Psycho Mantis do things like read your memory card or force you to switch your controller port to player 2. Couple this with a few of the other instances where the game requires some real outside-the-box thinking, like when it forces you to realize that someone has stuffed a time bomb in your inventory, and you get a real special gameplay experience. This kind of use of the medium was stunning in 1998, and as far as I'm concerned, stuff like this is still not utilized anywhere near enough even two and a half decades later. This is the kind of stuff I adore seeing in video games, with games like 999 and Spirit Tracks on the Nintendo DS having some of my favorite hardware exploring gameplay. The rest of the game follows through with the momentum that the first half built up, delivering even more great boss fights and even more action movie spectacles, and even hard-hitting emotional moments, including one particularly tearful one at the end of a long-ranged boss fight. The conclusion of this game is nothing to scoff at either, complete with a huge plot twist showing just how Liquid was able to know so much about your mission, a reveal of the mysterious deaths that had been happening around you, and a shirtless fistfight atop the Metal Gear Rex, and even a thrilling escape sequence at the end. All around, Metal Gear Solid 1 is a well-polished and incredibly fun game that isn't afraid to take some chances on using the medium in new and interesting ways, at least for 1998. The only thing really holding this game back now is pretty much only the outdated resolution, as even the polygon graphics really do have some charm now. And hopefully the new Master Collection release will help with that resolution problem. This game is the game that kicked off so many people becoming fans of Metal Gear and Kojima Productions too, and it's no surprise to see why. To follow up the masterpiece that was Metal Gear Solid 1, the Kojima Productions team decided to flip the script a bit and make a game that can be considered a postmodern commentary on the very thing it's a sequel to. Enter Metal Gear Solid 2, a game that everyone wanted to be a bigger, better Metal Gear Solid 1. And in my opinion, it really was. And I should point out this bias up front, this is absolutely my favorite Metal Gear Solid game by a long shot. The characters, the areas you infiltrate, the story, the meta-narrative that spans all the way to the marketing material, it's all a cut above in my opinion, and I adore it. So let's get into it. From a gameplay perspective, this game is just a straight upgrade over Metal Gear Solid 1. A new first person aiming mode, climbing and hanging, more interactive environments to mess with, and the most stellar change in my opinion is the updated guard AI. In addition to the advantages you get against them, like the ability to hold them up, they also have increased abilities to search in caution and alert modes, and the different loadouts they can have all make for a much more smooth sandbox where you can really mess around. Sure, it doesn't exactly have all the features that a more modern gameplay sandbox like Phantom Pain would have, but it's certainly a cut above its predecessor, and even the more integral stuff like the static camera feels a lot better in this game than it did in Metal Gear Solid 1. The game even opens with a great chance to explore all the new upgrades to the gameplay in the tanker section, where you get to play a Solid Snake who has teamed up with Otacon to find out about a rumor of a new Metal Gear. This section features tons of great settings and even a very fun boss battle to show you the ropes of what you can do, and even a full-on sneaking only section towards the end. Also, I'm gonna have to do the spoiler warning section of the MGS2 portion a lot earlier than I did in the first games, just because there's really no way around it. But before we get into that, if you liked Metal Gear Solid 1, you're gonna love all the new toys in MGS2 and you should absolutely play it. Okay, so now we're getting into spoiler territory. Remember that amazing tanker section I just gushed about as the perfect Metal Gear Solid sequel? Well, that actually ends right when Snake ends up getting caught in Ocelot trying to steal the Marine's new Metal Gear prototype, and Snake is dead. The tanker mission is an absolutely wild ride for an hour or two and you get the perfect MGS-1 upgrade. Up until Ocelot shows up, kills the Russian leader that had invaded the boat, gets apparently possessed by our good friend Liquid, and steals a brand new and very very cool Metal Gear Ray. 
At this point, the player has zero idea what's going on at all, and their main character is dead. It is an absolutely insane opening to a beloved sequel, and I love it so much. The player is instantly thrown into confusion and just has to see how this all shakes out. To top it all off, the game picks back up almost immediately, with a cutscene of a masked infiltrator making their way through the ocean, talking once again to our typical operation leader, Roy Campbell. Through their discussion, the player can glean that it's been two years since what has been dubbed the Tanker Incident, and that a terrorist organization has taken the President hostage on a giant rig that was put in place to clean up that very same Tanker Incident. And to add to the confusion, the terrorist leader is going by the name Solid Snake. Once the player gets control of their character, the Colonel Campbell re-explains the controls, which is weird seeing that we've already been playing for a couple hours. After a deja vu inducing section of waiting for an elevator while some guards patrol, we finally see who's really beneath the mask of the skull suit. Sons of Liberty? The name of their leader is Solid Snake. The hero of Shadow Moses? So that's why you changed my code name. An incredibly beautiful blonde twink. This is Raiden, our player character for the remainder of Metal Gear Solid 2. This twist is what really gave Metal Gear Solid 2 the reputation it got. I can't speak to how it was at launch, as much like with Metal Gear Solid 1, I was way too young to really know anything about the gaming sphere. But from what I can gather, this protagonist switch was incredibly contentious. While this game was still a critical success, its reputation among fans was always a little muddled, and when I first played through the franchise around 2014, it seemed to be considered a rather weak entry, and even people who liked it considered it weird at the very least. To get back to the game though, you're dropped in Shell 1 of the Big Shell Complex, which consists of six different struts and a perimeter around a core. There is also a Shell 2, constructed in a similar shape, with two shells being connected by one of each of their struts. The beginning of this plant section sees you largely traversing around the entire perimeter, collecting various equipment as you were given nothing at the beginning of this mission, and learning more about the hostage situation that is unfolding. I'll be largely skimming over the overarching plot until we get to the end, as I think the meta narrative is where the game really gets interesting, but the key parts of this first section involve meeting some kind of strange vampire man that can seem to live through getting shot in the head, as well as a woman with a large railgun that is immune to bullets and grenades. These two have managed to capture the president for whatever dastardly deeds they plan to have him do. During Raiden's exploration of Shell 1, you also come across a very familiar face of a man named St Oh, sorry, Iroquois Pliskin. Jokes aside, the game isn't trying to hide this information from you. The player is well aware that this is Solid Snake, whereas Raiden can't seem to figure that out just yet. It's a small piece of information that gives you a leg up over your main character in a mystery that in all other aspects leaves you just as confused as Raiden. Your main objective on Shell 1 is to get into the core and rescue the president, but first you find a man called Peter Stillman, a bomb disposal expert who alerts you to a third of the dead cell terrorist group, Fat Man. Fat Man has planted bombs all over the big shell and you and Pliskin split up in order to disarm them in time. Stillman has a rather interesting story exploring lies and guilt, but for the sake of time I won't really have time to talk about all of that. Confused by the seemingly amateur placement of the initial bombs, Stillman goes to explore and finds a large payload of bombs that can't typically be detected with your normal scanner. In an attempt to disarm these, Stillman gets caught in a trap by Fat Man and is killed in an explosion. However, Stillman was able to relay information to Raiden to let him know how to reach the large payload in Shell 1. After disarming that payload, you have your first boss fight with Fat Man. That is why I dislike boorish military types. It's time to start the party! The eccentric bomb maniac on skates forces you to juggle disarming bombs, knocking him down and shooting him in the head. Upon defeating him, he lets you know of one final bomb, but the game gives you no hints at all to find it. You have to use your equipment and the new ability in Metal Gear Solid 2 to move bodies to find that Fat Man died on top of the bomb. On your way back down from the top of the strut, you meet another familiar face. Given, however, that we saw Frank Yeager die, this actually gives us more questions than answers, but at least we are given a new way to get into Shell 1 Core by impersonating the guards. The Cyborg Ninja also lets you know the terrorists have access to a nuclear weapon, and that weapon was a Metal Gear, which was being housed by Big Shell, 
which in turn was a fake plant that wasn't really being used to clean up the spill from the tanker incident. At this point, you've probably got a pretty good understanding of how to actually navigate the struts and the connecting bridges, so the trip into the core gives a nice change of pace. Now we've got some good old espionage action, including a very cool sequence where you actually have to hold a guard's eye up to a scanner. This seemingly small mechanic has such detail that it even recognizes that they can't be knocked out or asleep as their eyes would be closed. You then begin the search for a president's advisor, who holds the information on where the president is being held. Upon finding this man, you'll also come face to face with Ocelot, who appears right as the advisor aims seems to succumb to some sort of sudden death. Ocelot sees through your disguise and narrowly dodges another loss of an arm as that cyborg ninja comes to save you. Now, from this point on, things get weird, which given how little we actually know of what's happening on Big Shell, that's kind of impressive. On your way to the president, who is in the Shell 2 core, you come face to face with the terrorist leader, the man proclaiming himself as Solid Snake, though he looks significantly older than we'd expect Snake to be. To clear this up, however, Pliskin finally reveals his identity as Solid Snake, as well as revealing that he's been working with Otacon to ride in. The imposter snake then hops on a harrier being piloted by Vamp, and our pro tag finds himself in a rocket fight versus a harrier. After defeating the harrier, it gets saved by the majestic Metal Gear Ray, and Raiden is forced to use the new ledge grab mechanics to make his way to Shell 2. Your next task is to make your way to President Johnson, which requires a very familiar Nikita missile section, though this time we have new and improved missile view. Once we finally reach the president, we get well, a lot of information, and it makes varying amounts of sense. To sum it up as quickly as possible, Johnson reveals the existence of an organization called the Patriots that secretly rules America, and that all the decisions of the Patriots are decided by 12 people called the Wiseman's Committee. The terrorist leader, who is actually the 43rd president, George Sears, the man behind the Shadow Moses incident, is actually Solidus Snake, another clone of Big Boss from Les Enfants Terribles. Solidus set out to learn who the Patriots were, Johnson had worked with the Patriots to try and get more power, and had started the nuclear launch sequence that is supposed to occur from Arsenal Gear, the secret fortress that Big Shell was made to cover up the construction of. Arsenal Gear also held an AI called GW that was capable of filtering information from digital communication, giving the Patriots the ability to shape history through redaction. Whew, I didn't speed that up at all. That's a, a, a fast talker. <laughs> this is where Metal Gear Solid 2's meta narrative really starts to kick into gear and to show how powerful this ability to filter information is, we need to look no farther than the advertising campaign for this very game. The demo, as well as any pre-release marketing, made absolutely no mention of playing as a different protagonist, instead focusing only on the tanker section of the game. This is part of the reason for why fan reaction to this game was so contentious, because fans were given the expectation of the perfect sequel where they get to jump in as Solid Snake once more, only to feel completely blindsided once the truth came out. It's Honestly, nothing short of genius, and the fact that Kojima Productions was so intent on staying true to the game's themes they shaped the marketing material to fit is nothing short of incredible. But once again, let's go back to the game. President Johnson tells Raiden to find GW's programmer, Emma Emmerich. GW is the AI on the arsenal here. Emma Emmerich is Otacon's sister, who can make a computer worm to delete the GW AI. At this point, Johnson starts telling Raiden that he needs to fulfill his role and asks Raiden to shoot him, something so weird and out of left field it makes very little sense. However, Ocelot shows up to ease the tension and shoots President Johnson himself. It's worth noting that through the vast majority of this mission, Colonel Campbell has been denying or asking Raiden to ignore Snake and Otacon altogether, and just wants Raiden to follow his mission to find the President. Even more importantly though, nearly everything Campbell relayed to Raiden as a demand of the terrorists or a fallout of the mission failure, including that the terrorists killed a hostage or the threat of dioxins reaching Manhattan if Big Shell exploded, were an outright lie. Ames had no idea of any hostages being killed at any point before Raiden met with him, and with Big Shell being confirmed to not be a cleanup plant, the threat of a chloride holocaust was also false as well. While we don't know exactly why, it certainly gives us and Raiden less faith in the Colonel. Okay, I'm gonna try to steamroll the rest of the story as this section has become unbelievably long. So, Raiden goes on the hunt for Emma and on the way runs into Vamp, a man he thought had been dead. However, he defeats him once more and finally finds Otacon's sister. 
This next section involves Raiden literally holding Emma's hand as they work their way back to Snake and Otacon so Emma can upload the computer virus. Most people hate this section, and from an objective standpoint, it's definitely frustrating. You can't do any actions while leading Emma around, she can't move on her own, and you move much slower when leading her. It even comes to a frustration climax as you are forced to protect her as she slowly makes her way across the outside of the struts. Metal Gear Solid 2's sniper section, in contrast to the very cool sniper duel with Sniper Wolf in the first game, seems outright designed to be as frustrating as possible. UAVs will fly in from your blind spots, guards will show up way late in a rotation forcing some incredibly quick shooting, and to top it all off, Vamp reappears and takes Emma hostage, forcing a final sniper boss fight but without any of the fun or danger from the aforementioned sniper duel. Now that I've complained about that section for a good paragraph, I'm going to say probably my hottest take of the whole video, which is that that Emma section is goddamn brilliant. The player's frustration just builds and builds so much that even after multiple playthroughs, getting past the sniper section feels like I just completed a marathon. And this feeling the player has, it's super important. Your ire for Emma needs to be taken into the next cutscene, which is one of the greatest cutscenes in all of video games. I'll let it play out in its entirety. I'm here. Got the disc. Emma set everything up. Uh, apparently all you have to do is pop in the disc. Uh, that should insert the virus into the AI. Is it working? Just leave it to Emma. What the? An antibody agent? Damn! The connection's been cut. Is the virus upload complete? I don't think so. The count stopped at 90%. Otacon. I don't think Emma's made any mistakes. But a portion of the worm cluster might have been altered after the disc left Emma's hands. By the Patriots? Will the virus still work? I have no idea. Is... Is everything all right? Uh, it's all right. Everything's all right. Good. At least I... I won't be adding another page to our family's dark history. Yeah, that's right. What if the virus doesn't work? Either destroy that thing, or take out Solidus and his men. How do we get on board? Hmm. I don't think we can. Unless somebody inside gives us a hand. Hal... I... I always... What is it? Fuck, man. I can't fucking do this. This seat's... Oh, fuck. You don't hate me? Never. I never wanted to get in your way. I never wanted to hurt you. I thought that with Arsenal, if I followed in your footsteps, I could be closer. I just wanted you to look at me. Look at me as... as a woman. Hey, hey, hey. I could never do that. Don't be so honest. It hurts. Sorry. Can I... can I ask you one last favor? Sure. Call me... call me... Emma. What? Please, call me...
What's wrong with EE? E? Emma? 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 Answer me! God, last thing he fucking says to her is what's wrong with EE? E? I know she's dead before he, she fucking hears Emma. Fuck this scene, man. It's so much fun. <laughs> Leave it to me. The iconic handshake in the most emotionally devastating scene in the game. That's why it's so genius! It's so good! Yeah, and the fucking... The reprise of the theme song plays. However frustrated I may have been with Emma, for how she slowed down the pace, for how she was completely helpless against the guards and UAVs, I never wanted her to actually die. It's such an interesting melding of gameplay to elicit a specific negative feeling in the player, and then killing off the character that was drawing the player's ire. Instead of trying to lead a player's feeling through story or cutscenes, Kojima Productions decided to make sure these feelings were uniquely the player's, and then they make you feel guilty for having them. It's honestly nothing short of genius, and it's a great example of really stretching how the medium can be used. So the gang comes up with a new plan, and before Raiden and Snake can head off, the cyborg ninja appears once more, and reveals they were actually Olga, the boss from the tanker section, in disguise, and knocks Raiden unconscious. Upon waking up, Raiden is tied to a torture chamber that looks incredibly similar to the one from Metal Gear Solid 1. Solidus and Ocelot take the opportunity to monologue at him, and Solidus explains that he was actually Raiden's commander in the Liberian Civil War, where Raiden was so good he earned the nickname Jack the Ripper. Olga also appears and explains to Raiden that her child was stolen by the Patriots and they threatened to kill her child if she failed her mission of assisting Raiden. Olga frees Raiden, and despite her best efforts, Kojima Productions does an excellent job of making sure that he is always decent in each camera angle we try. We meet up with Snake and make our way to the rectum of the arsenal gear, where everything finally comes to a head. Fortune catches up with them and challenges Snake, who she believes killed her father, and Raiden presses on to confront Solidus. Raiden is then forced to take on a horde of unmanned Metal Gear rays that have been created to defend arsenal gear. This is quite a fun boss fight once you get the rhythm down, though the sheer number of Metal Gears you have to take down on higher difficulties can be absolutely daunting. Eventually exhausted from the fight, Solidus appears to take out Raiden, only for Olga to sacrifice herself to save Raiden, and in turn save her child. At this point, Emma's virus also begins to affect the remaining Metal Gear rays. However, Fortune shows up after having defeated and captured Snake, and Raiden passes out. After waking up, it turns out Ocelot has come to the party, and Solidus reveals his plan to hunt down the Wiseman's Committee, and his plan to have Dead Cell take Arsenal Gear merely as a distraction so he could buy time. Ocelot takes this opportunity to reveal he was actually working for the Patriots the entire time, and that this entire setup was orchestrated by the Patriots. He reveals all the events Raiden and the player went through that resembled Shadow Moses were entirely on purpose. The terrorist organization, the mysterious deaths, the cyborg ninja, the harrier fight, the virus were all made on purpose to turn Raiden into a soldier on the caliber of Solid Snake. 
Ocelot then revealed Fortune's ability to not be hit by bullets was actually due to special technology. The same technology he used to dodge all those bullets when he stole Ray two years ago, and he shoots Fortune. Ocelot hops into the ray and fires the rest of its payload on the group, only for Fortune to rise, due to her heart being on the opposite side of her body, making Ocelot's shot not be immediately fatal, and she manages, somehow, to actually deflect the missiles. Ocelot's body then gets taken over by Liquid, who reveals he leaked the info to Snake and Otacon that led them to appearing on Big Shell. He then flees after setting Arsenal gear to crash into Manhattan, and stating he'll use Ocelot's knowledge of the Patriots' whereabouts to defeat them. And now we've made it to the big finale! Arsenal Gear crashes into Manhattan and comes to a stop at Federal Hall. Solidus and Raiden find themselves alone on the roof of Arsenal, and Solidus explains he was upset at Les Enfants Terribles for taking his opportunity to have a genetic legacy, and instead wanted to be remembered in history, and wanted to do that by destroying the Patriots so he could restore freedom to America. Which could be considered virtuous if not for all the, you know, terrorism and child soldiering. However, Raiden also gets a codec call. However, instead of it being from Rose, his girlfriend and support for the mission, as well as Colonel Campbell, it is instead from the Patriots, who are using an AI Rose and AI Colonel Campbell. This conversation is probably one of my favorite in all of Metal Gear, and involves the Patriots outlining how the digital age has created an overabundance of trivial information that would always be accessible, thus muddying the waters of truly valuable and important information. They explained the S3 plan, which Ocelot explained as the Solid Snake simulation, was actually called the Selection for Societal Sanity, and the whole incident was actually to test how the AI would handle a crisis. The Patriots wanted to be in control of which information got passed down to future generations as a way to help human growth. Then it's revealed why the Patriots wanted Raiden to be a part of this. With Solidus still standing, Raiden was someone who had been hurt and affected by Solidus enough to actually want to kill him, and you do, defeating Solidus in a sword fight as he eventually falls at the foot of the statue of George Washington before collapsing. That's so hype. That shit is not non lethal. <laughs> it's time for dramatic irony. Now, you may be thinking, why would the Patriots go through so much trouble just to control some information? Well, if you still aren't convinced that this is a pretty powerful tool, then I should reveal I left out a huge portion of the final act of the game, a part that has managed to confuse and muddle the reality of this game significantly, and in fact leaving it out probably almost made this game make more sense than it should. So let me reveal the truth here. After Olga frees you from the torture chamber, Raiden never gets his equipment back like Snake does in the first game. Raiden is literally stripped down to his most vulnerable and forced to make his way through the Arsenal gear hangar, and the entire time, things are really, really weird. You are able to do almost nothing while naked, as Raiden won't reveal himself, meaning no hanging or punching, you're utterly helpless as you dodge the guards here, and it's pretty rough. To top it all off, the colonel on your codec is talking straight nonsense in your ear, even going as far as trying to convince you to turn the game off. Raiden, turn the game console off right now. What did you say? The mission is a failure. Cut the power right now. What's wrong with you? 
and given how out of the box the Psycho Mantis fight was in the original game, I wouldn't be surprised if some players fell for the Colonel's tactic in an attempt to get their cool protagonist back. However, this doesn't work. The weird codec calls continue as you traverse the area, and even your footsteps appear to have a similar effect to the old VR missions lighting up as you walk around. Then, when you finally make it to the end, you see Snake. He's dressed up in his former sneaking suit and is here to save the useless, hopeless main character you're playing as now. The game shoves right in your face the character everyone wanted to play for this game, and right when you have to walk around naked and powerless. But the oddities don't end there. This solid snake also lets you know he's even got infinite ammo on account of his bandana. A very, very weird thing to say, even in a game as meta as this. Having a character outright defy reality like this feels a little out of place. And at this point, Snake goes on an absolute killing spree. Like honestly, this guy is a total monster, shooting everyone down in lightning speed. I mean, hell, it's tough for you to even get a kill during this section. In a game that was already keeping so much information from you narratively, you could always rely on game mechanics to make sense, but this section breaks that outright. There is no tactical espionage action here. It's just a bloodbath. And then the game just picks up as if that entire section just didn't happen. So after defeating Solidus, the game finishes out like normal, and Raiden finds himself in the streets of Manhattan. And life seems to be just going on as normal, with people walking about him going on with their lives. Then Snake walks up to Raiden, and the two talk about Raiden's future, and Raiden decides to throw away the life he didn't get to choose. That he's going to take his own experiences, whether they were real or not, and choose to live his own life how he wants. It's honestly a really beautiful ending to this character, and one that can be easily ruined, say, if you accidentally named Raiden Twink Lover 42069 as a dumb joke at the beginning of the game. Dog tags. Twink Lover 42069, dude! I fucked up the ending cutscene by making it not fucking sad anymore. <laughs> so that's Metal Gear Solid 2. I'm sorry the narrative section went so long. I'll try not to do that in this video until we get to Peace Walker and Phantom Pain, but I just adore this game so much for all its experimentation, for how much it pushes what we can do with the medium, and how we have seen so few games like it in the last two decades. I was originally going to make a whole video just about Metal Gear Solid 2's narrative, but I ended up taking a lot of that and putting it into this video section instead, and I think I'll have to postpone that other video, but I hope this sufficed. So at the end of the day, yeah, it's a great game, a huge improvement gameplay-wise over the first, and with a great cast of characters and a confusing, grand, and ultimately hopeful story. But I don't think any conclusion I can make will be better than Snake's final monologue. Hence? Life isn't just about passing on your genes. We can leave behind much more than just DNA. Through speech, music, literature, and movies, what we've seen, heard, felt, anger, joy, and sorrow. These are the things I will pass on. That's what I live for. We need to pass the torch and let our children read our messy and sad history by its light. We have all the magic of the digital age to do that with. The human race will probably come to an end sometime and new species may rule over this planet. Earth may not be forever, but we still have the responsibility to leave what traces of life we can Building the future and keeping the past alive are one and the same thing. That's real that's a really good ending. That's a really good ending. Next up is an absolute classic and a lot of folks' favorite Metal Gear Solid game, Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. This game is iconic enough to even get Konami to make a remake of it in Metal Gear Solid Delta. Dear God, I hope that that is actually good. This game is probably Kojima Productions' most consistent and well-rounded Metal Gear Solid game. From start to finish, it delivers top-tier gameplay, top-tier boss fights, top-tier characters. It's just amazing the whole time and features some of the franchise's most iconic set pieces. 
Let's start off with the aesthetic. Metal Gear Solid 3 takes place many decades before either of the other Metal Gear Solid games and follows our character Naked Snake as he drops into the jungles of Russia. For this game, Kojima Productions have leaned heavily into the campy action movie vibe, with even the opening movie being a cut above with the ever iconic Snake Eater providing a wonderful backing track to really get you pumped for this game. And once you get into the game proper, your snake for this game even performs the world's first halo jump. The codec, or should I say radio in this case, is even in this game, linking you to one of the best support crews in the franchise, featuring the mostly inept Major Tom, the extremely goofy paramedic, and the lovable Siggins. This game also captures a long-form survival mission vibe in a way that's a step above the first two games. Traversing the different jungle areas, interacting with the wildlife and environment, it all comes together for an incredible feeling of actually surviving and infiltrating that I don't think has ever been matched by a Metal Gear game before or since. Gameplay-wise, the game manages to once again improve on every aspect from the previous iteration, including more in-depth CQC, a camo index to make blending in more engaging, and even a full medicine menu and stamina meter. Unfortunately, on release, the game was still plagued by some, at this point, rather outdated fixed camera angles, but this issue was solved with a later updated release. There really isn't much more to say about the gameplay here, it's just the best that these early Metal Gear games have ever been, and given how the later games take a bit of a turn into a different kind of gameplay, if you enjoy the older game style of espionage action, this really is the best of the best. I also want to briefly mention the writing and the narrative of this game in a more spoiler-free way before we get into it later in this section. This story is a much, much more structured story than Metal Gear Solid 2's, leaning farther away from the more meta, experimental storytelling, and leaning 100% into campy action. And it's very good, but very different if you liked what Metal Gear Solid 2 was up to. This change is, in my opinion, a very, very good thing, as I don't think what Metal Gear Solid 2 tried could ever quite be captured again. All right. Now it's real spoilers time. If you don't want spoilers, just know this game is really, really good, and a lot of people consider it the pinnacle of Metal Gear Solid games. And in my opinion, I would play it before the remake, but make sure you play Metal Gear Solid 1 and 2, of course. Just on the off chance the remake is bad, I don't want it to ruin your idea of what Metal Gear Solid 3 is. For the sake of time, I'm going to quick and dirty my way through this plot and largely talk about some of my favorite sections or set pieces, as I have a lot in this game. We get dropped into the head of Naked Snake, a man who looks so similar to Solid Snake, we can only assume that this is the man that will eventually become Big Boss, though no one seems to regard him as such just yet. In fact, in this opening, you even have contact with someone who's called the Boss, but she's a woman who is explained to be your mentor. Your mission is currently to find and recover a man named Sokolov, who had information on a new weapon the Soviets had been working on. The opening of this game gives you an opportunity to experiment with some of the new CQC mechanics, as well as the added environmental mechanics, including dropping a beehive on an unsuspecting guard. Eventually, you manage to find Sokolov, and on your way to extract him, you're ambushed by none other than a young, beautiful Major Ocelot. Here we really get to see Metal Gear Solid 3's campy characterization shine, as we see Ocelot acting much, much goofier than we have ever seen him before, even going so far as meowing to call in his squad. Ocelot attempts to do a flashy maneuver with his gun to kill Snake, but manages to jam his gun and gets humiliated by Snake's CQC. Snake then plants the idea of that being a revolver technique into the man, and we start to see slowly how all these puzzle pieces start to fit into the future games. But that was some fancy shooting. You're pretty good. Pretty good. Sokolov reveals to Snake the weapon he was working on for the Soviets, the Shagohod, a tank capable of firing a nuclear missile, though it was still currently being tested. The virtuous mission, this opening mission, comes to an abrupt end when the boss meets Snake on the bridge and she reveals she has defected to the Soviet Union and that she was going to give them Sokolov and two Davy Crockett's. Kuwabara, Kuwabara. A very imposing man named Colonel Volgan joins them and tells Boss to kill Snake, 
She CQCs the fuck out of him and throws him off a bridge, though he manages to grab her headband. Snake survives and is told how to tend to his wounds. Volgan then uses one of the Davy Crockett's to nuke Sokolov's research facility with the intent to frame the boss for it. This triggered an immense political confrontation between the Soviets and America, with America denying any involvement and eventually coming to a deal of sending Snake and the Fox team back to Soviet Union to assassinate the boss, retrieve Sokolov again, and kill Volgan. To help, the KGB offered two contacts for Snake to talk to, Adam and Ava. Now tasked with a new goal and a plan to meet up with Adam, you can finally begin Operation Snake Eater. The beginning of this Operation Snake Eater plays out very similarly to the Virtuous Mission, with you exploring the jungle, collecting various resources, managing your stamina by eating whatever wildlife you happen to find along the way, and attempting to covertly take out the guards. You'll manage to cross paths with the boss once more, and once again get absolutely destroyed in CQC. After this, the first major story beat involves you arriving at the area you are supposed to meet up with Adam, but are instead met by a really cool woman on a motorcycle identifying herself as Ava. These next few cutscenes give us a great chance to see some really good characterization of our naked snake, a man who is very, very interested in talking about his hyperfixation on guns. He's silly, he's unserious, and I love him. Incredible. Do you like it? The feeding ramp is polished to a mirror sheen. The slide's been reinforced, and the interlock with the frame is tightened for added precision. The sight system is original too. The thumb safety is extended to make it easier on the finger. A long type trigger with non-slip grooves. A ring hammer. The base of the trigger guard's been filed down for a higher grip. And not only that, nearly every part of this gun has been expertly crafted and customized. After waiting till morning, you'll also run into Ocelot one more time, as well as his squad, although he seems to have taken a few of Snake's earlier lessons to heart, and not only trained his soldiers in a rudimentary kind of CQC, but also exchanged his original pistol for his revolver. It is so strange seeing this honestly quite inept Ocelot start to evolve into who we see in the first two games, but for now he's dumb and has a habit of getting humiliated. This aspect is where MGS3 really shines in my opinion. The characters are given so much more unique personality that fits in perfect with the campy action movie vibes. One of the sets of characters that really gets their goofiness ramped up to the max compared to the previous entries is the terrorist squad. Snake interacts primarily with the terrorist squad through boss fights, which sound ridiculous out of context. There's the Pain, who is able to use bees both as armor and weapons that force you to break his bee armor before you can get any good shots in. Or there's the Fear, the invisible crossbowman who jumps around in the trees and scavenges food to try to outlast you. Then there's the Fury, a flamethrower-wielding astronaut who explodes into a skull of, well, Fury, I suppose, after you beat him. These boss fights are, in my opinion, a lot more fun than boss fights from the previous entries, and the final boss fight, as well as the boss fight with the end, are really the cream of the crop here. The end, in particular, is probably the most engaging and riveting sniper fight maybe in all of video games. You have to go head-to-head -head with the world's oldest man who also has the power of photosynthesis in a battle that traverses multiple areas and screen transitions. Whether you choose to tackle this boss fight by using all of your stealth skills to sneak up on him, or trying to outgun him at a range, or even by using the super special tactic we'll talk about later, this boss fight is nothing short of iconic. One aspect besides the boss fights that really stands out to me is the unique game mechanics. It seems like every system can be used in ways way crazier than you could ever expect, and it really rewards creative player. You can do things like spin Snake's model around in the menu to force him to throw up any rotten food you may have eaten, or even trank poisonous wildlife to throw at guards. Or one of my personal favorite things, if you wait two weeks of real time during the end fight, he just ends up passing away. He was really fucking old after all. Okay, so I've gushed about game mechanics long enough. Let's get back to the story. You trek through the jungle, running into the zany cast of characters a few times before finally making your way to Groznygrad, Volgan's home base. But not before being greeted by one of the most iconic moments in gaming history, the Snake Eater Ladder. 
After a couple grueling boss fights, you're given a few minutes to just reflect on your journey so far. The very deliberate pause in the otherwise breakneck pace of this game is a breath of fresh air to collect yourself before starting your journey once more. The latter also doubles as an excellent way to help give the world some scale as you make your way to the mountaintop area. I think conversation about this set point over the years has kind of got memeified in a way that kind of takes away how impactful it really is. At the end of the day, yeah, it's a meme where you climb up three minutes of a ladder while a theme song plays, but I think its placement in the story is, is really something special, and I do wish we saw more stuff like this. In an attempt to learn about the Metal Gear, you sneak around and even disguise yourself as Volgan's boy toy to get deep in the facility, only to be discovered, rather unsavorily, and thrown into a torture sequence with the boss, Volgan, Ocelot, and Tatiana, a woman who Ocelot believes might be a traitor. Ocelot uses this opportunity to once again perform his little theatrics, and Snake ends up saving Tatiana from his revolver, only to be repaid by losing an eye to Ocelot's temper. At this point, you get a very fun prison escape sequence, though I think the catch-up prank from Metal Gear Solid 1 may be more fun. After being forced to confront the people you've killed, as well as finally getting a use for the old Chekhov's death pill introduced at the beginning of the game, you meet up with Ava again, refuse her advances once more, and get loaded up with C3 to blow up some fuel containers on Groznygrad. However, Eva and Snake are captured, and Volgan takes the opportunity to bad guy monologue and explain the Philosopher's legacy, a microfilm that contains the location of large amounts of money, and to explain how he got the boss to defect and managed to acquire the legacy and the Shagohod. From this point on, we've hit the endgame climax, with a boss battle against the fearsome Volgan, and eventually with the Shagohod itself. This fight is an absolute blast, especially if you've mastered mechanics like the Quick Reload, as you are given infinite rocket ammo. It's a high-octane action set piece and way more fun and cinematic than the one in Metal Gear Solid 1. A truly impressive end to a truly impressive villain. The finale of this game involves one of the most emotional moments in the entire franchise, and it's one I will refuse to spoil, especially with the remake coming out and a lot of people probably experiencing Metal Gear Solid 3 for the first time. The ending of this game is the small spark that eventually lights to ignite everything that happens later in the timeline. By all accounts, you have to play this game. It's incredibly good. So good, in fact, that I'm genuinely afraid the remake will be bad and tarnish its reputation. Metal Gear Solid 3 is a solid, cohesive stealth action romp with some of the most likable characters and terrifying villains the franchise has ever seen, all while refining the stealth action gameplay of the first two games to an incredible level. Now, with the first three Metal Gear Solid games out of the way, we can move into what a lot of people consider a completely new era of Metal Gear. Harnessing the power of the PlayStation 3, Kojima Productions set out to make their most cinematic Metal Gear Solid game yet, one that aimed to tie up as many loose ends as possible in the narrative while evolving the gameplay formula into something a little different. I do want to mention at the top here that I do like this game quite a bit, and I think its hours and hours of cutscenes aren't so bad, they are for the most part incredibly entertaining, However, I'll be keeping the spoiler section to a minimum later on while talking about this game, and if you'd like a much more in-depth critique of this game and its narrative, I suggest you take a jog on over to the Metal Gear Solid 4 Was a Mistake video by Stake Bentley. It's not as negative as the title makes it out to be, and I share a lot of the same criticisms and praises that Stake does in that video, and those thoughts are organized much more thoroughly than I could make here. So okay, preamble out of the way, let's talk gameplay. First off, this game is entirely a third-person shooter, and the opening act of the game drops you right into the war zone. Instead of a lone soldier stealthing through the jungle or a facility, you're instead trying to inconspicuously weave your way through and around battlefields between completely separate factions. The on-site procurement and stamina mechanics of the previous entry have been reworked into an ever-present shop and the simultaneously confusing and simple stress mechanic. Both of these are quite noticeable downgrades in my opinion if you enjoyed the gameplay of the previous entries, but I can't deny as far as loadout options and creative solutions go, the shop full of instantly delivered weapons and ammo certainly goes above and beyond. It's the start of a bit of a shift of how Metal Gear Solid games will play. There's still a stealth camo index, however instead of needing to go into a menu and swap outfit and face paint, you are instead given a piece of equipment called the Octo Camo. By standing still for a second or so on a surface, the Octo Camo will automatically adjust to match that environment. 
Along with the Octocamo, you are given a few more updates to your stealth abilities. Besides the new equipment from the shop, you also now have the Worm Crawl Maneuver, allowing you to move incredibly slowly while prone as to not give up much of your camo percent, while also giving you a wonderful view of Solid Snake's new cheeked up model. On the whole, the gameplay changes are... interesting? And in truth, it does almost feel like a different game, which is especially noticeable as they even removed quick reloading, an intended mechanic in previous games where you could instantly reload by unequipping and re-equipping your weapon. This gameplay difference came to a head for me in the first boss fight, where instead of non-lethaling by carefully using Trank pistol shots, I was instead forced to just buy a shotgun and some non-lethal rounds from the omnipresent store just so I would have enough ammo to actually deal any significant stamina damage to the boss. It definitely felt weird. It was fun, but definitely different and weird. Aesthetically, the game is also a bit of a change. As opposed to the lush jungles or a snow-covered facility or a structure built over an ocean, this game is slightly less inspired, although much more varied. Spanning over the course of five acts, you'll visit a desertish area that seems to be inspired by the ever-prevalent brown filter seen on every military shooter around this time, then a forested area that's actually quite fun, although not quite as iconic as the imaginary jungles of Soviet Russia from the previous game. Then you go to a nondescript European city area, and then two spoiler areas that are actually fairly interesting. The game is also very graphically impressive, with models that are leagues above Metal Gear Solid 3's, and cutscenes that feature even more impressive stunts and choreography. The music, too, is still just as good as we'd expect from a Metal Gear Solid game, and is especially potent during one section of the game towards the end. I do wish I had a bit more to talk about regarding the gameplay, but truth be told, it's just very different. The stealth mechanics are probably the part that managed to evolve neatly into this game, but the gunplay has transformed entirely. It's definitely a new era of Metal Gear Solid. And one last note I want to make before we get into major spoilers is that the characters in this game are... I guess inconsistent might be the best word. There is just so damn much going on in this game with a relatively small cast of characters going on an entire globetrotting journey while also uncovering all the major missing links in the plot that some characters are just forced to act in the strangest ways to keep the plot moving forward. There are more than a few quite exceptional characters, for example I think Old Snake and Sunny are very straightforward and fairly well written characters, but more than a few get a little confused when trying to wrap this whole saga up nicely. And now we need to get into spoiler territory. There's no way I can sum up the entire plot in any sort of succinct way, so I'm going to use this section to outline some of my favorite and least favorite parts. First up on the very good list is Snake, Otacon, and Sunny's relationship. This makeshift family trying their best is incredibly heartwarming, a bunch of hurt, traumatized people still trying to make right in the world. The mission briefing cutscenes before each act really sell this, as we get to explore around the plane watching Sunny try her best to get Snake to stop smoking or cook Otacon and Snake some delicious eggs. In my opinion, Sunny is probably the best character in this game, and since I don't think it's totally clear, she's also Olga's daughter, the child stolen by the Patriots in Metal Gear Solid 2. It seems our silly boys managed to rescue her in the interim. Now on the flip side, I really dislike the Naomi and Otacon relationship. It feels incredibly rushed and forced just to give Otacon a chance to have an emotional attachment to a character besides his husband Snake. Naomi's character in general flip-flops all over the place, seemingly just for the sake of dramatic tension, but that's a whole nother can of worms I don't have a ton of time to get into. Now for another positive, the game manages to maintain the over-the-top goofy spectacle and keep level-headed during the dramatic moments, and sometimes mix both. Whether it's the ocelot finger guns moment or the funny monkey doing the MGS2 pose, there's a lot of heart in this game. A great example of this is the incredibly homoerotic fight scene between Vamp and Raiden. I mean, it's iconic, and hell, Platinum even designed most of Raiden's moves in Revengeance based off of this scene. Another heavy spoiler example of this is the Rex vs. Ray fight. It's basically a dream come true for Metal Gear fans. You mean I actually get a fight in one of these? And it's topped off by Liquid Ocelot's over-the-top theatrics. And the last excellent example of this is in the final shirtless man fight of Snake vs. Ocelot. These two souls duking it out even after the conflict is over just to add some closure to their own story. 
Ocelot had been through it all and forced to watch the likeness of the man he admired reappear in his clone Solid. It encapsulates the themes of Metal Gear Solid 4 incredibly well as we watch this saga age in reverse, from its decayed old form back through all its earlier iterations, a true celebration of how far the series has come before finally laying the story to rest. It's nothing short of beautiful. And despite how memorable this final fight is, it's actually not the best display of the game's themes. That actually goes to the entirety of Act 4, where you revisit Shadow Moses. On your way over, Old Snake even dreams about his very first journey through the helipad area of Shadow Moses before landing in that very spot, with everything just how you remember it. Every vent, every box, all exactly as it was decades ago, only this time completely devoid of life. There's no guards here anymore. There's no use for this part of Shadow Moses anymore. All you get are your own thoughts and memories as you retrace through your past. Even as you progress through the facility, even to where you first met Otacon, there's still nothing here but memories and lifeless robots. It's scary how different of a feeling is elicited during this revisit to Shadow Moses, and it's easily my favorite part of Metal Gear Solid 4. As I write this script, I want to just harp on more criticisms of this game, how Johnny's story throughout the game was on track to turn him into an incredibly smart character, only to pull the rug out at the last second and make him a funny poo-poo man for all eternity, or how Raiden's inclusion in this game absolutely destroys all of the reasons I adored how Raiden's story ended in Metal Gear Solid 2, or how the B&B &B unit was so uninspired that the only thing people remember is how if you make them relive their trauma long enough, they have a psychological break where they will now dance around with your J-pop from your iPod, which always felt a little gross to me. But what I've come to realize as I write this is for every misstep this game has, there's actually something equally well done. An emotional moment that hits as hard as it should, or a moment so strange you're instantly charmed. And despite all the weird characterization, somehow, that near final sequence where Snake crawls through the microwave hallway fully expecting his death, while his friends Raiden, Meryl, and Johnny fight tooth and nail to protect him, that you really feel what this game was trying to say. That our hero, old, past his prime, trying his damnedest to save this world with his friends, and managing to do so in the end. It's a good game, and I think it's absolutely worth playing. Now, if you thought Metal Gear Solid 4 was a departure from the typical formula, well, get ready for Peace Walker, the PSP mainline Metal Gear Solid game. As you may have guessed, one of the biggest things leading to this change here is the shift from home consoles to a portable console, although it was eventually upscaled for an HD collection release on consoles. The control scheme for this game was largely adapted to resemble Monster Hunter, which while at the time it wasn't terribly big in the West, was an incredibly popular franchise in Japan. There's even a handful of Monster Hunter themed missions where you have to try to beat up a Rathalos and a Tigrex. It's a ton of fun, but significantly harder than those fights are in Monster Hunter, strangely enough. So where exactly does this game fit in? Well, to keep spoilers light for now, you pick up as Naked Snake after the events of Metal Gear Solid 3. The game involves you discovering and eventually destroying a new Metal Gear, surprise surprise, that is planned to be entirely autonomous as the ultimate nuclear deterrent, as it won't hold the same reservations for damning the planet that humans might in the event of a retaliatory nuclear strike. The gameplay also has quite the significant changeup, as while it maintains the huge amount of equipment we expected from Metal Gear Solid 4, you are now required to develop these weapons through your mother base, and expanding and earning the resources to do so by recruiting enemy soldiers by way of low orbit balloon travel. That means in between your stealth missions and Metal Gear uncovering, you've also got yourself a bit of base management, and for the most part it's actually kind of fun. It also means going non-lethal now has an immediate benefit besides just your score at the end of the game, as these soldiers can be recruited and increase your base productivity. The hardest part of this game, in all honesty, comes from if you're playing the game in order, as the graphical and mechanical downgrades for Metal Gear Solid 4 is immediately apparent. The Monster Hunter style area transitions also take you back to the kind of map Metal Gear Solid 3 was, even though it's significantly smaller. Once again, the gameplay itself takes quite a drastic turn as well. Instead of one consistent adventure, or even longer acts, the game is instead divided into very small missions that you can choose your equipment for before you sortie. This means that you get bite-sized chunks of tactical espionage action at a time, but has the added benefit of if you want to switch up your loadout or try something new, it's much, much easier to do so. 
The gameplay loop is kind of refreshing, even if it's very different, and it's actually enjoyable enough that Metal Gear Solid V takes this and iterates on the concept to a wonderful degree. The shift to a portable console also means that graphically, there needs to be some huge adjustments from the incredibly graphically intensive previous entry. However, Kojima Productions managed to do this gracefully by adopting a comic book inspired stylistic approach to the cutscenes, illustrated by the incredibly talented Ashley Wood. These cutscenes are also interactable, often having little minigames for you to accomplish. These cutscenes are absolutely beautiful, and easily my favorite part of this game, and it's a great way to make the narrative cohesive while still having the rather open sandbox mission structure. Now it's spoiler time once more, and huge warning here, especially if you were dodging spoilers for MGS3, I'll have to talk about that ending section from MGS3 in this game, so if you don't want to be spoiled on that, please leave now. <laughs> So, Peace Walker follows Naked Snake, now known as Big Boss, as he attempts to build an army to unite the world, which was what his interpretation of the boss's will was. He and Kazuhira Miller make MSF, no, not that one, but ironically it stands for Military Sans Frontiers, a PMC group that is intended to help out countries or groups that would otherwise be unable to defend themselves. The two are visited by a professor and young girl from Costa Rica who were asking to hire MSF as Costa Rica is unable to bear arms due to its peace constitution and a suspicious armed force had entered the country. The young girl, Paz, also revealed she was captured and tortured by this armed force. To muddy the waters a bit, Snake and Kaz suspect the scholar of working with the KGB, and he reveals that the Soviets intended to hire MSF to investigate the CIA's suspicious activities in Costa Rica. To force Snake's cooperation, though, the scholar also revealed a tape that Paz was able to record while captured that unmistakably had the voice of the boss on it. Once arriving in Costa Rica, Snake manages to uncover that nuclear weapons are being shipped into the country. Nukes. They're bringing nukes into Costa Rica. Holy Mother of God. Snake decides to make friends of the local guerrillas called the Sandinistas and their commandant, Amanda. She had confirmed the armed force in the country was indeed CIA and that they were using incredibly advanced hardware. The group was then attacked by those advanced drones who stole Amanda's brother, Chico. This opening is, in my opinion, really something special. It's all brand new characters again, save for Big Boss, as opposed to MGS4, which seemed to bring in every character that had ever been mentioned. It's refreshing, honestly, and all the characters, especially Kaz and Paz and Chico, all get a great opportunity to get fleshed out, especially if you take the time to listen to the tapes and the mission briefings. The story for this game is, for the most part, also fairly straightforward. You find out that the CIA has been smuggling all the equipment into Costa Rica, and that another Emmerich, in this case Otacon's dad, had managed to make a nuclear launching creation, which the incredibly named Hot Coldman intends to use to show its strength in nuclear deterrence. The boss fights too are quite memorable. Well, not the random tank fights, but the ones against the AI weapons who all sing like Vocaloids and gave us the wonderful sound bite. And the main Metal Gear in this game is the aptly named Peace Walker, a nuclear deterrence platform whose use is twisted by Hot Coldman to be used for terror. The real emotional crux of this game, however, comes from the AI pod that would control the Peace Walker. Developed by the scientist Dr. Strangelove, a woman who had loved the boss and held a hatred towards Big Boss for killing her, not knowing the entire story of Operation Snake Eater, as the boss's true reason for defecting was covered up by the government in the years after the operation. Dr. Strangelove had been abandoned by the boss and was attempting to bring her back in the form of the AI pod, making a deal with the CIA to have access to all the documents concerning the boss to ensure a perfect recreation. Strangelove believed the boss would be the only mind capable of controlling the perfect nuclear retaliation device, however Strangelove more than anything wanted to create the AI pod to finally learn the truth about the boss from the woman herself, about everything that happened during Operation Snake Eater and what her will really was. This plot point surrounding the boss and her will is why I think narratively Peace Walker is very important to understanding how Naked Snake eventually evolves into Big Boss. Snake was forced again and again during this game to contend with the choice he made to kill her, to try and carry on a legacy he didn't quite understand, and how the consequences of him killing her has affected everyone who cared about the boss. 
One of the more emotional hits is when Peace Walker escapes over the Rio San Juan, and during the chase, the horse Big Boss rode that resembled the same steed the boss herself rode was gravely injured, and he once again had to put a part of the boss to death. The Peace Walker conflict ends when Coldman manages to fake a nuclear strike, thus turning on Peace Walker's retaliatory strike, and Snake is forced a third time to take down a likeness of the boss, with her recreation being the one that is controlling the Peace Walker. However, even Naked Snake was unable to take down the resilient Peace Walker, and instead the boss's will was shown through as her recreation in the AI pod decided instead of launching the nukes, to sing, and walked itself in the ocean both to prevent the nuclear retaliation and overwrite the fake missile signals. What? What's going on? That song. Boss, is that you? How in the... Look! It's functional compensation. When the human brain is damaged, sometimes it recovers over time. Other parts of the brain take over the functions of the damaged parts. Mammal and reptile were patterned after different parts of the human brain. When those parts were assembled together into one, they must have become capable of functional compensation. With this, Strangelove was able to realize that this was the will of the boss to lay down her gun. However, Naked Snake, who was forced multiple times to take up arms against his own mentor, his hero, never given the option to lay down his gun, instead decided that the boss had betrayed him, and he would instead take up the mantle correctly, under the name Big Boss. This is what I think fans really wanted to know, how Naked Snake, forced to kill his own mentor, forced by his country to hide what she had sacrificed, forced to repeatedly face and relive his biggest trauma until he coped the only way he could, by saying the boss's will he was so set on following was actually wrong, so that he would no longer have to face that guilt. It's nothing short of tragic, and I adore the way this game handled Naked Snake's turn. From this point on, things get dark. Big Boss is not the same kind of hero he was during Operation Snake Eater, and he's a long way removed from the man Solid Snake will turn out to be in the far future. MSF instead begins to expand heavily as a PMC, even going so far as creating their own Metal Gear, Metal Gear Zeke. Although in time, Paz steals this, announcing that she was actually working for a group called Cypher and the Man Zero, the man who Snake had cut ties with years ago after being unable to come to terms on what the boss's will was. Zero instead created Cypher, and planned to unite the world not under a single army, but under an intelligence community able to guide the flow of information to control the population. This is where the connection of the Patriots come into play, as it's revealed in MGS4 that Zero's Cypher eventually takes on a will of its own. Paz wanted Big Boss and MSF to work with Cypher to act as a deterrence to protect this new world order. However, Big Boss refused, determined to not abandon his calling as the boss did, and Paz and Big Boss are forced to fight. Kaz reveals after the battle that he knew that Cypher and Intern Zero were funding MSF's massive expansion as they wanted MSF to join them, and thus Big Boss tells his troops that they would build a nation of their own, Outer Heaven. Peace Walker is one hell of a game, and if it wasn't for the fact that it was relegated to portable consoles, I really think it would be one of the greatest Metal Gear Solid games. The game's narrative alone manages to hit so many emotional and important aspects that lead into the whole franchise, and it does it rather cleanly as well, at least much more than Metal Gear Solid 4 did, though admittedly that game had to tie together a lot more threads. But absolutely, if you get the chance, I highly, highly recommend this game. Ashley Wood's illustrations alone make this game worth experiencing, even if the gameplay itself can get a little samey after the while. 
Next up, we come to Metal Gear Solid V Ground Zeroes, a small prequel style game to the upcoming Phantom Pain. We also got a return to home consoles and a huge graphical upgrade thanks to the Fox engine. When I say this game is gorgeous, I absolutely mean it. The environment, the lighting effects, the animations, and oh god, the character models. This game is an absolute visual treat. Along with the graphical upgrade, this game and Phantom Pain also have a huge tonal shift. The Metal Gear Solid games have always dabbled in sensitive content, but this was largely in the form of just exposition given over a codec, and the games always had a silly action movie tone that was able to couch just how disturbing some of the content may be. However, Ground Zeroes does not take on that silly tone. This game is, to put it bluntly, absolutely fucked, especially a particular set of tapes you can collect and listen to. But before we get into the narrative, let's talk about some of the upgrades and gameplay changes, because there are a lot. First off, this game gives you the fullest control of Snake that you've ever had before, even managing to improve on Metal Gear Solid 4's gameplay. Controlling Snake in this game feels incredibly smooth, and even allows for high-risk stealth gameplay as you sprint into the compound only to dive into the bushes right as a guard comes by, or managing to roll right past a spotlight as it turns around. Guard AI has also been improved as well, with guards being able to spot you from incredibly far away if you aren't being careful about just how shrouded in darkness you are. Interrogations also make a return, which I've always adored, but along with that you also have a much cleaner ability to move guards around or into dumpsters or porta potties after you knock them out. This game just gives you so many tools, so many ways to approach every situation, it really has become the ultimate stealth sandbox. I really have nothing but good things to say about this gameplay in this game and Phantom Pain. It's unbelievably fun, interesting, lets you be creative, and could be incredibly punishing as well. Due to Ground Zeroes being such a small game, realistically it's just one, albeit pretty large mission, and a handful of side missions, I'm going to save a lot of the larger discussion about the changes in the gameplay and everything for the Phantom Pain section. For now we need to jump into the story of this game because it's an absolute fucking doozy. Spoilers from here on out, and a content warning as well. This game starts after the Peace Walker incident of the last game, when Kaz and Big Boss are alerted that Paws survived the fight with Big Boss and was being held at a prison facility called Camp Omega. Kaz tells Big Boss some of his contacts at Cypher think Paws might be a double agent. Chico, the boy from Peace Walker, has also ran off on his own in an attempt to rescue Paws and was unfortunately captured as well. To just stack on the pile of things, the UN has scheduled an inspection of Mother Base to ensure there's no nuclear weapons, and Big Boss and Kaz decide Big Boss should rescue Paz and Chico, and you are dropped near Camp Omega ready to start your mission. However, before we start infiltrating Camp Omega, we also get a scene of Chico while he was being held prisoner. His captor gives Chico a Walkman and implies to him that Paz was killed. This strange man also tells Chico to give Big Boss his regards, implying that this man has planned for Big Boss to try and rescue Chico and Paz. That man, who I guess I should just say his name is Skullface, then covers up some XOF logos before heading off in a helicopter. Our view of Chico here is really what sets the tone of the game. Chico has been absolutely brutalized, a hole has been made in his chest that his headphones were plugged into, and his Achilles tendons have had bolts torn through them, ensuring he is unable to walk. It's absolutely sickening seeing this boy who was silly and fairly likable in the previous game be put through something this severe. Eventually, Big Boss appears in front of Chico, who is so traumatized he begins to panic upon seeing Big Boss, so much so that we have to knock him out and carry him to the extraction point. At this point, Chico wakes up and lets Big Boss know that Skullface killed Paz, and he gave Big Boss the tape that Skullface gave to him. We actually get to do something interesting here and listen to the disturbing tape so that we can uncover exactly where Paz's location is, based on like context clues, and we make our way back through Camp Omega until we find her tied to a boiler. As we carry her back, we get to learn just how traumatized Paz was too, as she mutters the entire time about the things she went through. Eventually, Big Boss manages to bring Paz to the extraction point and make it out just before the Camp Omega guards discover them. In the helicopter, Chico sees that Paz has a scar on her stomach, and Big Boss realizes she has likely been planted with a bomb and calls for a medic. They are forced to operate on Paz immediately, and we get an incredibly graphic scene of the medic managing to remove the bomb from the girl. As Big Boss's helicopter approaches Mother Base, we see that there is currently an attack unfolding. 
Big Boss manages to help Cause escape as everyone else on the base had been killed. The group manages to escape just as Mother Base sinks into the ocean. However, Paz stands up and alerts the group she had a second bomb planted in her, and she attempts to save them by jumping out of the chopper just before she explodes. However, the shockwave managed to affect their chopper, causing it to crash into another helicopter that was tailing them. And that is where Ground Zeroes ends. There's no funny jokes here, no silly enemies. In fact, Skullface might be one of the more deranged villains that we've ever had in the franchise. We're forced to witness firsthand the atrocities this man inflicted on our allies, on our friends, and maybe it's no wonder why Big Boss strayed so far from the man he was at the beginning of Metal Gear Solid 3. And the game ends with a final text scrolling to let us know the US said it or its allies were not involved in the incident and that no survivors were confirmed. This game sets the stage incredibly well for fans and pain. The major tonal shift, the absolutely incredible upgrade to the gameplay, and the complete destruction of everything Kaz and Big Boss had built. And with that, we can jump into our final Metal Gear Solid game, The Phantom Pain. Alright, now that we're in the Metal Gear Solid 5 Phantom Pain section, I can talk a little more in depth about all the new goodies this game gives us. First off, all those major control changes I mentioned are still present in the Phantom Pain, only now with an even larger world to explore. The game also brings back a couple major things from Peace Walker, mainly the mission-based structure and the base management, though with both heavily expanded upon. The missions now take place in large sections of the overworld, often featuring incredibly complex or vast facilities, structures, or fields, giving the missions much, 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 much more depth than any of the ones in Peace Walker. There's also a handful of side ops that let you travel around the open world to do various tasks like collect animals or rescue soldiers. If you weren't a fan of the mission-based structure in Peace Walker, then there's a good chance you'll prefer the way Phantom Pain does it, as some of the major main missions almost feel like their very own Shadow Moses with just how large and detailed they are. The other improvement over Peace Walker is the base management. It's much more intuitive and takes you through a tutorial for each major upgrade you can get, and the number of facilities you can make has increased drastically, allowing for even a wildlife preservation and separate forward operating bases. Most astoundingly, though, is probably the ability to visit Mother Base, explore all the different struts, even beat up your soldiers. Don't worry, they seem to enjoy it quite a bit. This game feels like a perfection of the formula Peace Walker was attempting, but couldn't quite reach due to the hardware limitations. Aesthetically, the game manages to capture a very 80s feel, which given the time period makes a lot of sense. Many of the outposts you'll sneak around will have radios playing popular songs of the era, such as Man Eater or Take On Me, and the track that ties the theming of this game together is Midjor's cover of Man Who Sold the World. I don't know if I said that name correctly. The only thing that manages to stick out weirdly from this time period is Snake's admittedly quite advanced equipment, such as his fancy eye droid and his magic vape that makes the <laughs> sound. The areas of this game are also quite intriguing and features two major areas, Afghanistan and Africa. Sorry if it looks like someone took a bite out of this map, I did. These two areas are generally split into a desert and a jungle, and are incredibly visually appealing, though I will admit with how much you bounce around these maps, there's very little chance I'd be able to identify where on either map I just got dropped in. However, that problem is almost entirely solved by the beautiful facilities and structures you'll sneak around. There are so many detailed, memorable areas that will stick out in your mind, even if you can't pinpoint where in the map they might be. To be honest, this is where the game sticks out to me every time I play it. There's one area in particular where you're tasked with retrieving a rocket launcher that feels so open with so many routes and simultaneously so challenging. It's like a new adventure every time I play. I do have one major dislike in this game, which is the adjustments to the codex. Or maybe it's more apt to say complete lack of codex. You'll still talk to your allies through the radio, especially before and after missions, as a kind of briefing, and there is technically a codec button you can press to get hints, but with the shift to this open world, always on kind of gameplay, most of the conversations happen as you sneak through the missions. I think this on its own isn't bad, but then it gets coupled with the tapes. A vast, vast majority of exposition, even incredibly major plot points, are relegated to these optional tapes. 
you can play them during missions and still play while you listen, but it's not quite as seamless as you'd like. Any story-relevant convos will completely drown out your tapes, forcing you to rewind or restart them, and any loading screen will also completely cut off the tape, forcing you to fast-forward to the place you were previously. It's more than a little clunky, and the fact that major plot points are stuck behind these, I wouldn't be surprised if this contributed to the lackluster reception the narrative got. However, if you take the time to listen to them, which I highly suggest you do, you get quite the intriguing story as you progress through the game. So the verdict is, this game is incredibly fun. Like, unbelievably fun. The missions are varied and interesting, your tools cover such a wide range of possibilities, and as per usual, you can make the AI do some pretty ridiculous things. And let's hope you find your fun there, because the narrative is not really very fun at all. It retains the dread and heavy tone from Ground Zeroes and nearly cranks it up to 11. Spoilers from here on out, everyone. Buckle up. First off, it's probably worth addressing the reputation this game has. On release, this game was heavily criticized for cut content and even leaving out a major part of the storyline towards the end. Personally, aside from that one major part, I feel like a lot of the plot threads are wrapped up here in a pretty satisfying way, but the scars of cut content do tend to linger throughout the plot. This was also the game that made Konami famously cut ties with Kojima, heavily affecting the game's development during the final stretch by limiting his interaction with his team, and ultimately shipping a product that I doubt the team considered finished. It's honestly a huge bummer we only ever got to see 90% of what this game was supposed to be, but I think it's more than enough to make a satisfying story. And given the fact that Death Stranding is my favorite game, part of me is kind of happy that Kojima has managed to make his own company away from Konami. The game kicks off with you in a hospital bed with a doctor telling you you've been in a coma for nine years. Given that the last thing you remember is that helicopter crash, that kind of makes a lot of sense. As the doctor helps you get your bearings, he also reveals that you've lost your arm and got a piece of helicopter lodged in your skull that they are unable to remove safely. Before you can manage to recover completely, the hospital is attacked and the nurse and doctor helping you are killed. However, a nearby patient manages to save you by catching the assailant on fire and they fall out of a window. However, the trouble doesn't end there as the hospital seems to be under siege by an entire enemy force, with many gunmen wandering the halls and indiscriminately shooting every patient and doctor in the hospital, clearly intending to leave no survivors. However, at the same time, a man on fire, whose clothing seems to resemble a certain villain from your past, also seems to want you dead, though he has no qualms with killing those gunmen either, even saving you from a few. As you continue to progress through the hospital with your mysterious cheeked up friend, you manage to acquire a gun and split up from the man to clear out the lobby of the hospital. However, the man on fire chases you there as well, until eventually duking it out with a whole ass tank. You manage to sneak your way outside, just as your fellow patient rolls up with a truck, and you hop in and start to escape. However, as you're driving by, flaming vehicles begin to fall out of the sky. Eventually you crash, and when you come to, you're met with none other than Ocelot, atop a white steed who gets you up on his horse and gives you a shotgun, as the man on fire gives chase. After a chase through the woods, the first mission of the game is finally completes as you get to safety. And all you know is nine years have passed and V has come too. There's a lot that happens in this game, so I'm going to try my best not to go as in-depth on every mission and keep the discussion to major moments I think are important or drive home the themes. But fair warning, even with the vast majority of missions skipped entirely, this discussion will be very long. A lot happens in this game and I love it, so I have to give it the time it deserves. I'll also go over some of the major tapes that I can only guess more than a few people skipped over entirely, which I honestly can't blame them for. Okay, back to it. After your rescue, Ocelot tells you that Kaz and you need to rebuild your army, and that Kaz has currently been captured by the Soviets. Ocelot equips you with a new fancy arm and gives you some new gadgets and sends you on your way. Eventually, you make your way through this camp and find Kaz, and I don't think anyone is ever quite ready for this next part. Kaz has been tortured, and the Soviets have taken his left foot and his right arm, and after placing the sunglasses back on the broken man, Snake picks him up to take him to the extraction point. The entire time, we have to hear a broken Kaz pleading for Big Boss to say his famous line, and this really sets the tone away from the previous games. The iconic, campy, kept you waiting, huh, would feel incredibly out of place here, and honestly, it's heartbreaking. You also get your first run-in with the Skulls here, a group of mysterious soldiers shrouded in mist. 
After avoiding them and making it to the new extraction point, Miller laments to Big Boss in the helicopter about how he was a fool to trust Cypher, and how he wants to do better this time. The opening missions of this game really set the initial themes in motion. While there's the obvious phantom pain from these two men who have literally lost limbs and comment on it, there's also the loss of the original mother base. These two men attempting to rebuild, regain what they had, and make something for the future. It's an absolutely stellar opening and really sold me on this game. The next few missions are a little lower stakes as your new group, the Diamond Dogs, get settled, recruiting or rescuing soldiers and taking out some enemy comms equipment. That is, up until you meet the best boy in the whole game, DD. This puppy during a mission catches the eye of Big Boss, who sees the poor puppy missing an eye of his own and Fultons him up to Mother Base. Ocelot takes on training the dog at Mother Base till he grows up, and eventually, once fully trained for combat, he dons an eye patch and a knife and joins Big Boss on his missions. Next up, we get a little return to the events of Peace Walker as Huey sends out a call to Diamond Dogs that he wants to defect from Cypher and join them. How did he get to Cypher, though? Well, Huey was incredibly insistent on the nuclear inspection, the one that resulted in an XOF attack on Mother Base, and even escaped on an XOF chopper that day. Kaz wanted revenge on Huey and an explanation for what happened, and tells Snake to rescue him. During the rescue, Snake manages to see an argument between Skullface and Huey on whether or not to use the AI pod from Peace Walker, and much like Hot Coldman did 10 years prior, Huey gets pushed down the stairs. Snake finds Huey's lab and the AI pod holding the boss's AI. The AI pod is filled with pictures of Huey and Strangelove, as well as a small boy that we can assume at this point is Otacon. As the two escape, Skullface shows up once more, only this time we get a clearer view of his giant robot, the bipedal Sahelanthropus. This Metal Gear design was my least favorite for a really long time, but it's grown on me quite a bit these days, and a reprint of the model kit is coming out next year. Anyway, after escaping and returning Huey to Mother Base, we get a classic Ocelot torture scene. Only this time it's not on us. Between a mix of torture and truth serum, Huey manages to say very little about the events nine years ago, continuing to claim his innocence. However, Ocelot was able to learn that Cypher was in Africa to make a weapon that could surpass Metal Gear. He claims that what they're doing in Africa is the missing piece. A weapon to surpass Metal Gear. Meaning it's not just another nuke. Huey, upon further interrogation, appears to know very little, but that Cypher seemed to be interested in some sort of cloning project, and that it might be connected to the weapon to surpass Metal Gear. Anyone got any guesses on what that might be? Okay, I gotta move a little fast here, this game is long as fuck. In Africa, our major new character comes in the way of a leader of a local squad of child soldiers. This leader, also a child dubbed White Mamba, is a feisty little guy, and tries repeatedly throughout the game to kill Big Boss. He's apprehended and taken to Mother Base along with some other child soldiers the Diamond Dogs has saved, and the White Mamba eventually sows unrest in the children stating that they want to fight, but we'll have to jump back to that later. More important in Africa, though, is discovering exactly what Skullface is attempting here. Eventually, we learn about and make our way to a facility called the Devil's House. Upon entering, we are greeted with a haunting scene of dozens of people filled in the beds of a makeshift hospital ward with growths on their chest and earbuds stuck in their throats. We make our way through these horrors and find the child soldier we were looking for who had been experimented on in the same way as the other patients. As it turns out, Skullface is here as well and discovers Snake and the child and orders a floating child to kill them. This boy manages to summon the same man on fire we saw in the opening mission who attacks Snake. However, after a few moments the man on fire freezes and it's revealed the floating child is busy killing the tortured child soldier before returning to the man on fire who can begin to move again. Just a little bit of hints in this kind of mystery between these two. The man on fire burns the entire facility and Big Boss barely manages to escape. Now, up to this point, I've not mentioned the floating boy, and truth be told, at this point, we know very little about him and the man on fire. The only major info we have on them is their eerie resemblance to both Psychomantis and Volgan, respectively, though we'll learn more about them later through some lore tapes. At this point, we are introduced to what is called the Vocal Cord Parasite. It's what Skullface was working on at the Devil's House and appears to heavily affect folks who have had the tapes and earbuds in their throats, but doesn't seem to affect some people who, by all accounts, should have been infected by a parasite. 
As such, the actual transmission of this parasite is a mystery at the moment. However, you don't get much time to investigate as an outbreak of the parasite begins to happen on Mother Base. This section of the game is actually really cool. Ocelot creates a quarantine zone and you are tasked with moving folks who are infected there with very little to actually go on. There are a few missions you can take to possibly learn more about it, but as you go on the missions, you'll get your biggest clue as more obviously infected people are moved to the quarantine zone. Eventually, the cause of the virus is a little more clear, and the fact that there's a language's known bio for each soldier starts to make a little more sense as well. It turns out the virus affects people who speak a certain language. You then have to go through Mother Base, find all of the soldiers who speak that, and put them in quarantine. You lose them as members of your different teams, and Mother Base's growth slows down significantly. It's a very cool way of mixing this narrative and actual gameplay mechanics, and it forces you to figure it out. It's pretty genius. Eventually, you hear word of an old man that can treat this, and you embark on another really memorable mission. Another Skulls fight followed by an incredibly detailed mansion stealth section make for an incredible sequence where you eventually find this old man, Code Talker. Code Talker explains the vocal cord parasite reacts to the language spoken and kills the host they infect. He also shows Snake an herb that halts the parasite by making them unable to reproduce. Most importantly, he explains what Skullface is planning with this parasite, to wipe out all languages except for English from the Earth. Traveling back to Mother Base, we also encounter another of Skullface's experiments, the Metallic Archaea. This cloud of corrosive metal is able to instantly tear apart the chopper the group is flying in, forcing another encounter with the Skulls. Code Talker explains the goal of this was a way for Skullface to disable nukes. He could give nukes to any group around the world and never be at risk of retaliation himself, while simultaneously devaluing just how much power the nuclear superpowers of the world actually have. This wide distribution of nuclear weapons also gives Skullface a channel for distributing the vocal cord parasites across the world. Now, with the stakes well and truly set, Big Boss and the Diamond Dog set out to Skullface's base to capture and interrogate him. Eli, the White Mamba, and Huey also join the mission with the former sneaking on and the latter wanting to amend and prove he is an ally. OKB Zero is, in my opinion, the most fun infiltration mission in the game. It's basically split into three tiers, with each one ramping up the difficulty, forcing you to absolutely play to the best of your ability, and it's a blast. Once you make it to Skullface, we get ourselves the legendary monologue sequence. Skullface explains everything. How he was tasked with cleaning up after Snake in Operation Snake Eater. He explains how he wants to use the vocal cord parasites to have ethnic cleansing on a global scale. He outlines how he absolutely hated Zero, and how as a child his culture was stripped of him entirely. Contrary to what Kotaker had thought, Skullface actually wants to eliminate the English language and have nukes take the place of that language, while being able to control them with Sehilanthropus and the Metallic Archaea. Skullface travels with Snake to the power plant where Sehilanthropus lies, and has the floating boy, who I'll call his actual title, the third boy, summon the man on fire to kill Snake. However, the third boy doesn't resonate with the man on fire like usual, and instead resonates with Eli in the nearby helicopter, and together they telepathically activate Sehilanthropus. Then we get the iconic Skullface line. Such a lust for revenge! Ooh! As Sehilanthropus turns its guns to the forces of XOF, murdering every last one of them. Skullface attempts one more monologue before getting crushed by Sehilanthropus. The fight versus Sehilanthropus is incredible, as you launch everything in your arsenal at it, as Miller calls in supply drops, and even your pilot Pequod helps out with strafing runs in the helicopter. It actually feels like you're getting to work as a whole team for once, and it's a blast. After the battle, Kaz picks up Big Boss and they return to where Skullface was crushed. Big Boss grabs the parasite too, but only finds two of the three spots filled, and Skullface remains cryptic when asked where the third is. Big Boss also attempts to destroy the remaining two, but the third boy manages to snag one unbeknownst to anyone there. Finally, these two men are able to get revenge on this man. The man who twisted them, tore their lives apart, tore their bodies apart, and my god does Kaz go hard. He shoots off Skullface's limbs as recompense, and the two leave Skullface there to die. However, these two men's revenge is cut short as Huey deals a finishing blow. 
Thus ends chapter one of The Phantom Pain. It's an absolute trip. It manages to keep the tone set by Ground Zeroes, manages to match the players and big bosses quest to end Skullface, and manages to end it in a satisfying, well, almost, thanks to Huey, way. Now chapter two begins, the real Phantom Pain. It's when the Diamond Dogs realize, even with their enemy gone, Skullface has still affected them in unbelievable ways. The opening missions of Chapter 2 largely revolve around trying to clean up all the info Skullface had on the vocal cord parasites so that it doesn't fall into the wrong hands. However, things quickly start to turn to the dark once more. Big Boss retrieves the AI pod that had remained at Huey's base as Skullface had no intention to use the AI. When it is sent to Mother Base, Kaz opens it up to discover that Strangelove had been inside and died a little over six months ago. Obviously shocked by this, Ocelot and Kaz interrogate Huey once more, who tries to tell them Skullface killed Strangelove one day and locked her in there. When pressed more, Huey claims Strangelove actually sealed herself in there to commit suicide, and when asked about the C-section scar on Strangelove's body, Huey claimed he didn't know where their son, who Strangelove calls Hal, was. Huey's story gets more fucked, but don't worry, we'll return to that later. At this point, I think it makes sense to talk about one of my favorite parts of the game, the third boy and the man on fire. The man on fire was seen crushed just before Sahelanthropus was activated as the third boy resonated with Eli instead. Snake manages to retrieve the man on fire's body, and it's explained that it wasn't just a resemblance to Vulgan, the man really was him somehow. As it turns out, Vulgan didn't die in his battle with Naked Snake, but instead went into a coma and was sent to a Soviet facility that researched paranormal abilities, since after all, he could control lightning. It turns out the thing that kept Vulgan alive in his coma was his desire towards revenge on Naked Snake. It turns out at the same time Big Boss awoke from his coma, Vulgan did as well, and met up with a child who was also at the facility, the third child who had psychokinetic abilities. As it turns out, the third child's mind was heavily influenced by others' thoughts, which the gas mask was used to help alleviate, but seemed to heavily resonate with the negative thoughts of revenge. In fact, before the boy arrived at the research facility, a helicopter he was traveling in got close enough to the hospital where Big Boss was, and his thoughts of revenge on Skullface, even in a coma, were enough to resonate with the boy and cause a reaction strong enough to crash the helicopter. As such, this third child was drawn to Volgan's desire for revenge, and the two began to act on Volgan's desire, attacking Big Boss at the same time XOF was attempting to kill him. However, as we know, Big Boss escaped with Ocelot, and eventually these two were recruited by Skullface, who realized he could use them as weapons. The two work for Volgan until eventually the third child is drawn to Eli's hatred instead, and abandons Volgan, who is crushed by the Metal Gear's loading platform. So, when Big Boss retrieves Vulgan's body, Vulgan awakens to attack him once more, though Vulgan, for some reason, stops his assault and eventually finally dies. But we'll talk about that, as well as the third child, a little bit more shortly. We now need to turn back to Eli, who has begun to sow more unrest at Mother Base. Eli took a necklace that meant a lot to the child soldiers and threw it into a tank filled with disinfectant. A sniper, who we were able to recruit earlier in the game called Quiet, who exhibits similar powers to the Skulls, decides to go down there and retrieve it for the children, but sustains major injuries. During a medical examination, the Diamond Dogs find out that Quiet has the vocal cord parasites, though they haven't spread due to her reluctance to speak. They also learn that her lungs were completely burned from a fire. In her charred lungs, they also uncover a flower petal from the same flower that had been in Big Boss's hospital room proving she was the assassin sent to kill him back then. Kaz chose to have Ocelot torture her to learn who gave her the parasites, though she remains... quiet. After the interrogation, Code Talker speaks to her in Navajo, to which she responds that Skullface infected her with the English strain of the vocal cord parasites, and so she decided to never speak English again. Okay, I know we're jumping around a bit, but I promise this is the best way to explain these events. We can now jump back to Eli, who orchestrated the child soldiers to return to their homes, though Snake manages to retrieve them all once more. Ocelot attempts to interrogate Eli about why he did this, but Sahelanthropus breaks through the wall and retrieves Eli, and the children manage to escape to their own island with Sahelanthropus. And in-game, that's the end of their story. This is by far the most egregious cut content in the whole game, as the mission that's supposed to wrap this up, the Kingdom of the Flies, is at least from what we can glean from the Phantom episode section on the collector's disc, incredibly fucking cool. 
But instead, nope, we got nothing. What a bummer. All right, back at Mother Base, Ocelot questions Huey on why Sehelanthropus was operational at all, and Huey admits he helped Eli repair it. Ocelot also noticed the cockpit was only big enough for a child, and Huey admitted he put his son in the fucking Metal Gear. I feel so bad for Otacon. Huey was a really shitty dad. Ocelot tells Huey off, but Mother Base has yet another issue to contend with. This next mission, Shining Lights Even in Death, is, as far as I'm concerned, the best mission in this entire game. Hell, it's one of the best moments in the entire franchise, and this really, really explains how Big Boss ended up so twisted by the world. The vocal cord parasites had appeared once more in the quarantine zone, but Code Talker's treatment no longer worked. Any soldiers sent in had not returned, and the only thing retrieved was a video showing the soldiers being attacked by infected members. Snake enters the area and is immediately confronted with several dead diamond dogs who have the actual names of the actual fucking soldiers from your mother base, so here's hoping you didn't get too attached. Big Boss also finds a scientist who gives him goggles that let him see the infection in the soldiers while saying something cryptic about not being a snail. Code Talker, however, picks up on this, stating that the infected soldiers have a desire to get outside so the birds would feed on them and spread the parasite, much like birds do to snails. Snake, however, was unable to pull the trigger on the soldiers attempting to get outside, and Kaz was forced to drop a bomb on the soldiers on the top floor. Big Boss, on his way back down, was forced to kill the infected members, which, as it turns out, was nearly every single person. You are forced to contend with killing your own soldiers, the men who manned Mother Base for you, who you see QC'd on the base. It's horrifying. The soldiers even eventually salute Big Boss and tell him to kill them. Big Boss finds only one soldier who's not infected, but on the way out it's revealed he couldn't run from it either. Big Boss was forced to kill every one of his own soldiers and was unable to save even a single person. This breaks him. This absolutely destroys him. And hell, it destroyed me too. During the spreading of the ashes of the soldiers, Big Boss instead wipes the ashes on his face, stating he plans to make diamonds from their ashes, to which Kaz jumps in agreeing that it was like a shining light even in death. Kaz and Ocelot interrogate Huey, as it turns out equipment he installed emitted beta rays that made the vocal cord parasites mutate so that Code Talker's treatment no longer worked. They also revealed they knew Huey was attempting to sell the parasite to Cypher in exchange for his safety. Fuck Huey, this guy certifiably sucks. However, Big Boss manages to show restraint somehow, and instead of executing Huey like the soldiers want, he exiles him leaving Huey away from Mother Base for good. Okay, we are almost at the end, don't worry. In fact, I'm actually going to have to skip Quiet's storyline, but it's good and you should play the game to experience it. It's kind of sad too. There is, however, one major character we haven't talked about. Pause. Throughout the game, you'll be tasked with finding wandering Mother Base soldiers who had been on the original Mother Base nine years ago. When you save them, you'll get a picture which you can bring to Pause, who is somehow alive in the medical bay. However, as you continue to save these soldiers, the player begins to realize what's really happening. After all, we saw Paws explode. We know she's dead. The Paws Big Boss is seeing is a hallucination, a manifestation of Big Boss's guilt at not being able to save her, which he is forced to contend with every time he does manage to save a Mother Base soldier. It is a heartbreaking storyline, and this dissonance with reality, it's really the central theme of this entire game. And so we reach the end. The truth. It's worth noting here there's an incredibly important cassette tape that can be completely skipped at this point. 
At some point in Chapter 2, Ocelot wanted to figure out why Eli kept calling you father and takes his DNA to check it against yours. At this point in the game, it's heavily implied that Eli is Liquid Snake. All the talk of cloning, the accent, the lust for revenge. But when the results come back, the DNA doesn't actually match. This makes zero sense at all, as it either means Eli isn't Liquid, which doesn't really make much sense since, like, what is he even doing in the game if he isn't, or the other option, the truth. Over time, we begin to realize who we really are. More specifically, we remember what happened after the plane crash at the end of Ground Zeroes. But we remember something strange. We see Big Boss go into a coma. However, the doctor points to us, stating we have shrapnel in our head, which means only one thing. We're not actually Big Boss. As it turns out, we were simply one of the soldiers accompanying Big Boss, the medic in the chopper that crashed near Mother Base nine years ago. We play through the events of the opening mission once more, but this time as the ambulance crashes, Ishmael, our fellow patient who saves us, crawls out of the wreckage and is helped by Ocelot. Ocelot reveals Ishmael is actually Big Boss, and they discuss the whole body double plan to have our player character, Venom Snake, be the new Big Boss. Big Boss rides off intending to create his outer heaven, and we flash back to the helicopter crash, seeing it instead from our actual perspective as the medic, and seeing how we extracted the bomb from Paws and even protected Big Boss with our body, which resulted in the shrapnel in our skull. We now, as Venom Snake, listen to our last tape from Big Boss himself. It reveals that we aren't Big Boss, but in a way we actually are. We've contributed to this legend with Diamond Dogs just as much as the real Big Boss. It's such an interesting play that this Big Boss, the one that everyone wanted to know how he became who he was since Metal Gear Solid 3 released all those years ago, was actually someone else entirely. I think a lot of people consider Venom entirely separate from Big Boss, but we were Big Boss. We experienced the trauma Skullface inflicted on the Diamond Dogs, of finally realizing our revenge with Kaz, and of being forced to kill our own soldiers due to Huey's meddling affecting the Parasite. I absolutely love this plot twist. I think it's beautifully written. The last cutscene with Venom shows him listening to the other side of the tape, labeled Operation Intrude N313, the code name of the operation from the original Metal Gear. Venom sees his reflection, covered in blood, with his horn longer, as he has become the demon Big Boss. Was this his own decision? Was he forced to become this in this twisted plan from Ocelot and the other Big Boss? Well, it doesn't really matter now, and he accepts his fate. The game ends on a final conversation between Ocelot and Kaz, as Ocelot reveals the truth. Kaz is furious at how he was deceived and vows to help the Phantom and his sons just so he could send Big Boss to hell. Ocelot says if he goes back to Cypher, he'll aid the other son and be his enemy, setting up why they are against each other in Metal Gear Solid 1. And that... That's the end of the Phantom Pain finally linking the whole timeline together. I'm sorry I went so in-depth on the plot there, but there's a lot going on, and I feel like people are too hard on this narrative. It's a tragedy throughout, filled with some of the most horrific scenes we, and in turn, Big Boss, have ever had to experience. It really informs the first Metal Gear games in an interesting way, and even with the cut content, I'm astounded it managed to fit together as cleanly as it did. It's a beautiful game, a blast to play, and I can't recommend it enough. And with that, we've reached the end. We've discussed all the major Metal Gear Solid games. At this point, I hope I've convinced you to give them a shot, especially with the Master Collection out now, as they really are one of the most influential video games that have ever released. We've seen brilliant melding of gameplay and narrative, mechanics that have pushed the hardware and the medium, difficulty that respects the players, stories that make you cry and laugh and think and sometimes fill you with dread, characters that you'd have to be insane not to like, and sometimes it's clumsy, sometimes it's clunky, sometimes these games try too hard, but it's all so good, so honest, so unique, that there really is nothing like Metal Gear Solid. 